that will Whether you're afraid like these guys or just confused, watch Johnny Robertson and Religious Review Wednesdays and Thursdays at 11 a.m. on WGSR 47.1, Comcast Cable 17, Time Warner Cable Channel 5, Chatmoss Cable 14. Are you going to church only to find a club? Are you tired of looking for the Bible but only getting babble? If you want to find people who are studying God's Word, come examine the Church of Christ. We're meeting right here at 250 the Boulevard in downtown Eden. If you want to hear more plain Bible teaching, watch A Word from the Lord Thursday nights at 9 o'clock right here on WGSR. Some people call him the devil. Other people say he's got folks reading the Bible. See what all the talk is about. Watch Johnny Robertson and Religious Review Wednesdays and Thursdays at 11 a.m. on WGSR 47.1, Comcast Cable 17, Time Warner Cable Channel 5, Chatmoss Cable 14. The views expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect the views of the station, its employees, or ownership. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Word of the Lord. James over here with you. Here's our content information. If you'd like to study the Bible with us, we'll meet at Two Feet of the Boulevard, Sundays at 10 and 11 a.m., and also Thursday nights at 7 p.m. And uh, right now, on our Thursday evenings, we're going through the, uh, the book of Ephesians. And if you'd like to study that with us, that's where, that's where we are, and hope you will come out and join us. 276-340-2653 is how you can reach me, or... 336-394-5721 is uh, phone numbers or word from the Lord at gmail.com. <clears throat> and uh, if you'd like a DVD or a Bible study, we'll be glad to assist you in any way. Just give us a call. Uh, you saw the information from Mark and Micah a little bit ago. This is how you can meet with the, the folks in, uh, in Danville or Martinsville, 823 Starting Avenue in Martinsville or 120 American Legion in Danville. And uh, we'll be certainly... Uh, Say, glad to say that you'll be welcome there if you will, if you will uh, visit with them and uh, come out and study the Bible with us. <clears throat> Recently in the newspaper, uh, I saw this article, or this article came across my desk when the members gave it to me and, <clears throat> thought they, and found it interesting, and there are some interesting comments in this uh, 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 article. The headline says, When the Bible Becomes a Weapon. This is from USA Today, I think February 28th is the, is the date on this, when the Bible becomes a weapon. And in it, the, the author, who happens to be a Presbyterian minister, uh, talks about how the Bible is used and misused as a weapon. In other words, people make it say whatever they want to say, and he uh, talks about how it was used during the Civil War for uh, pros versus con. Pro, pro and cons of slavery and things like that. And then he applies it to today, how people use the Bible to, to uh, uh, engage in a war, a political war or cultural war, and make, and make the Bible say what they want to say. In other, defend, in other words, defend their position with the Bible. But, and he talks about the Bible being a weapon and, and shouldn't be used as a weapon uh, in, in such a way. And I want you to notice some of the things that he talks about and how he is basically saying it is wrong to use the Bible in this way. Now here's one of the quotes from, from this, uh, this article. This, the man who wrote this is named Henry G. Britton, and he's a pastor of the Fairfax Presbyterian Church in Virginia. And he writes, In January, megachurch pastor Joel Olstein told CNN's Piers Morgan, that homosexuality is wrong because, quote, the scripture shows that it's a sin. And he says, Osteen isn't the first, nor will he be the last to make this observation, of course. Now, I, I just want to take a side note here and say I'm surprised Joel Osteen said homosexuality is a sin. He won't say a, an atheist is lost. He won't say that, uh, uh, I'm surprised he even used the word sin, really. He's so non judgmental. But, he says homosexuality is a sin because the Bible shows it's a sin. Okay, so is it wrong then? Is that using the Bible as a weapon? Is that using the Bible as a weapon just to say, well, the Bible shows it's a sin? Now, I don't know that Mr. Osteen could show where it's a sin, but nonetheless, he is using the Bible as a weapon, This uh, the writer of this article is saying. And then he says, new biblical, 
biblical perspectives are needed today. Now think about that. New biblical perspectives are needed today, including those of gays and greens. Now when he's talking about greens, he's talking about individuals who, uh, you know, the, 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 the green peace people, you know, use green energy and, and so forth. Stop you driving your car or whatever. He says, we need to use new biblical perspectives in order to reach the gays and the greens as we discuss contentious issues. He says, yes, it is true. The Old Testament says you shall not lie with male as, as, as with a woman, as it is an abomination, Leviticus 18, 22. Well, Mr. Presbyterian preacher, I can assure you this, that the New Testament says that too. It's not just the Old Testament. You know, the New Testament condemns homosexuality just as much as the Old Testament does. But he says we need new biblical perspectives. Now, friends, I want to ask you this. Are we supposed to put the Bible down and stop using it as a weapon against social issues like homosexuality? Are we supposed to lay it down and, and say, well, you know, that's the old way of thinking. We need to use the Bible in a new way. Or is it the same yesterday, today, and forever? He says, just as it says that God killed Onan because he spilled his semen on the ground, in both cases, now here's how he's justifying it, in both cases, relationships that did not produce children were condemned. That's not why it was condemned. It wasn't condemned because it didn't produce children. Is it abomination if you don't have children? There's a lot of people who are married, scripturally, I might add, who don't have children. Does that mean that that's an abomination because their, uh, their relationship does not produce children? He says in these cases, relationships that did not produce children were condemned because the Israelites were under orders to be fruitful and multiply. Can you imagine, is that the new biblical perspective that we're supposed to have? Is it using the Bible as a weapon to contradict what this man is saying? Is it using the Bible as a weapon to talk about the correct relationships between man and woman? Is it using the Bible as a weapon when we say, or when we show in Hebrews chapter uh, 13 and verse 4, where God says that marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Are we supposed to then use new biblical perspectives and say, well, God won't judge whoremongers today and God won't judge adulterers today. That seems to be the case. Last week we discussed how guys like Jerry Falwell and Billy Graham are using these new perspectives to change the way they teach marriage and divorce, change God's laws because apparently it's going to hurt somebody's feelings and maybe we need to think about it and revisit it because maybe God didn't think about how bad things were going to be and maybe he didn't realize that, you know what, this is going to be too rigid if I leave it this way. Or do you think that God really knew what was best for mankind and so we best just leave it alone? Now, the Presbyterian preacher who wrote this article would have us to believe that, well, we need new biblical perspectives when it comes to the marriage uh, situation in our society today. He says, but perhaps reproduction is no longer the goal of every person and every marriage. Many couples choose not to have children or marry late in life when they're unable to produce children, okay? Okay. Does that mean then that we should change God's law on marriage? And we should say that two men can marry? Or that two women can marry? Are we using the Bible as a vicious, malicious weapon when we say, no, God's law on marriage is one man, one woman for life? Matthew 19, verse 6. And what God's joined together, let a man put asunder. Is that really a weapon? Is that using the Bible as a weapon? Is that using the Bible to justify a cultural position? Or could it be the scriptural position that God wants us to hold? Is it using the Bible as a weapon? You see, now our Presbyterian 
writer, author, Mr. Henry Britton, he goes on to write. He says, New Testament values of faithfulness, love, sacrifice, and promise-based commitment can be practiced by heterosexual couples without children and the same-sex couples as well. Do you hear what you're saying? We need to change the Bible, and we don't need to use it as a weapon to defend an archaic way of life, an archaic social standard. We don't need to use it as a That's what he's saying. Is it really using the Bible as a weapon to show that, you know what? While faithfulness, love, sacrifice, and promise-based commitments are indeed values of the New Testament, is it using the Bible as a weapon to condemn homosexual, same-sex couples? Excuse me, but I do believe that the Apostle Paul tells us in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 11, let's just back up here, verse 9, he says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, there's your homosexuals, abusers of themselves and mankind, there's the sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. Do we need to have new biblical perspectives on these social issues? Look, if we're going to change our biblical perspectives and not use the Bible as a weapon against homosexual, same-sex couples, then are we going to change our biblical perspectives, use new biblical perspectives, and change our attitude toward thieves? Are we going to change our attitude toward drunkards? Well, I guess, we, I guess we should. I guess we just say, well, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the New Testament commands faithfulness and love and sacrifice, and you're just going to have to sacrifice your goods and your possessions so somebody else can take them whenever they want to. Is that the new biblical perspective that we're supposed to have? Or is it using the Bible as a weapon to condemn thieving, thievery, robbery? Is it using the Bible as a weapon to condemn the covetousness or drunkards or extortioners? See, I submit to you, friends, that it's men like our Presbyterian pastor who wrote this article that we're reading is the problem in our society. The the, the weapon of the Bible does not need to be changed. We need to change men to conform to the Bible. Don't change the Bible to conform to men. See, the problem we're having is people realize that it's going to be hard to get people to conform to what God says. And so, like most lazy people do, they want to, well, let's take the easy way out. Let's just change the Bible to conform to man. And then we can make everybody happy. And we can just all have flowers in our hair and we can sing, you know, kumbaya around the campfire and everything's going to be good in the world. How about we use the Bible as it's intended? And if it's to be used as a weapon, let's use it as a weapon. See? Our Presbyterian pastor that wrote this this article, he seems to want to dumb down the Bible. He says discussions of gay marriage can focus as much on scriptural equality as on the ability to reproduce. The Bible is not discussing same-sex relationships on the basis of the ability to reproduce. So you've got your, you've got your, your, your starting point all wrong, Mr. Britton. You've got your starting point all wrong. God is not condemning same-sex marriages because they can't reproduce. He's not condemning them because they don't love. He's condemning them because his intent on marriage was one man and one woman. Have you not read 
that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? See? Verse 3, Matthew 19, verse 3. They said, is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And Jesus said, look, he which made them at the beginning made them male and female. For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. You should understand. You should understand by reading how God created man in the beginning and instituted marriage in the beginning. That was always in his intent on it. It had nothing to do with the ability to reproduce. It has to do with this is how God intended it. Do you think God didn't foresee that a man and woman could, remarry, could marry and they might not have children? Do you think God did not foresee the fact that somewhere down the line a man and woman might marry and they not have children for some reason or the other? So God's focus was not on reproduction. This was how he designed marriage. We should not have discussions on gay marriage and say, well, we can all be equal because that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible doesn't say, well, we should focus on equality. How about we focus on the intent of marriage from the one who designed marriage? See? Now, is it using the Bible as a weapon to condemn such, such uh, uh, policies? So let's answer the question, is the Bible really a weapon? Is the Bible a weapon? Or should it be used as a weapon? Let's just see what the Bible says. Are we supposed to use new biblical perspectives on verses like this? In Ephesians 6 and verse uh, uh, 10, here's what the Apostle Paul says. He says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Sounds to me like a soldier who is getting ready to go to war. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers, against rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt with the truth, with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Now, is the Bible a weapon? Should the Bible be used as a weapon? Yes, it should. And it should be used as a weapon as God intended it to be used. Now, now Paul did tell Timothy to rightly divide the word of truth, handle aright the word of truth is what, uh, is what the uh, idea is. Handle it correctly. And you know, a weapon in the wrong hands Right, dividing the word of truth, handling it right. A weapon in the wrong hands is very dangerous, just like you saw earlier from uh, uh, Mr. Charles Stanley. He's, a, he's chopping up, and abusing, and misusing the Bible, and he's using it as a weapon, really, for Satan. He's using it as a tool of the devil, making it say things that God never intended. He's no different than our Presbyterian uh, Neighbor here who writing, was writing this article saying we shouldn't condemn homosexuality because that's an archaic uh, uh, thought. He's no different than Charles Stanley. Yeah, the Bible's a weapon. It's the sword of the Spirit. It is what the, the Spirit uses to cut deep. Look at this. The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the Spirit and of the joints and the marrow, and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Should we use the Bible as a weapon? Should we use the Bible as a weapon? I say we should. I say we should use the Bible as a weapon, use it as God intended, and whether it be on social matters 
our, our spiritual matters, let's use the Bible as it was designed for mankind. It's just as relevant today as it was when it was written. You know why I know? Because it came from the mind of God. It came from the, man who cre- it came from the mind that created man. That's why it's suited for man. We don't need to change in these new, new biblical perspectives. Why change the word? Why change the word? But see, men often want to change the word because it doesn't suit what they think. That's why you have books like the NIV comes along. Let me tell you, the NIV, the NIV is going to lead a lot of people to hell because it abuses and misuses the scripture. See? And a lot of times people don't even recognize when the Bible is not even being read. The caller that called in and said Mr. Stanley was reading from the King James and then we put it up and said, hey, wait, he's not quoting from the King James or it'd be word for word. What did he say? See, people don't even know the Bible well enough to recognize, hey, that's not right. That's why we tell you, you need to follow along in your book. Get your book out. Get your Bible out. Follow along with us. See if what we're teaching is indeed from the Word. Let's use the Bible as it was intended. Look what God says. Is the Word a, is the word a weapon? Jeremiah 23, 9, Is not my word like a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces? The Bible is a hammer that can destroy things like denominational doctrine, false teaching. It'll destroy it. That's why, friends, that's why we show you, we play for you what these false teachers are saying. And then we use the hammer of God's word to break it in pieces like a hammer beating a rock. Now, are we supposed to use the Bible in such a way? Are we misusing the Bible when the Bible says it is a weapon, it's a sword, it's a hammer? Are we supposed to use it in that way? You know, I saw a guy on TV the other day, he was making a chair and uh, using all kinds of tools in his shop. And he said, but before we get started, let's always talk about shop safety. Read the directions and use the tools as they're supposed to be used. Hello. Let's use the tool as it's supposed to be used. Let's use the weapon as it's supposed to be used. See? That's what we're talking about. Let's use the Bible the way it's supposed to be used. If it's supposed to be a weapon, let's use it. What do you use weapons for? What do you use weapons for? How about use a weapon? How about use a weapon to defend? Weapons are used for defense. Look what the Apostle Paul said in Philippians 1.17. He said, but the other of love known that I am set for the defense of the gospel. I am set for the defense of the gospel. He's ready to use a defense. Now what do you think Paul used to give his defense? 2 Timothy 4 verse 16 he said at my first answer no man stood with me. All men forsook me I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. He said look I'm ready to give an answer. I'm ready to give a defense. Now shouldn't we be the same way? Shouldn't we use the weapon as is intended? Philippians 1 verse 7 even as it is meet for me to thank this of you all, because I have you in my heart in so much as both of my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are partakers of my grace. Paul defended the gospel and he used it to defend what he taught. He used the gospel as a defense. Someone says, well, why are you, why are you preaching what you preach? He gave a defense. Someone says, well, you're a blasphemer. He gave a defense. He used the gospel as a defensive tool. Convicting people by 
by, uh, by the scriptures? See, the, the Bible is a defensive tool. Look at this. In Acts chapter <clears throat> excuse me, 18, we'll start about verse 26. No, 24. Acts 18, 24. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man, mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of the Lord, the way of God more perfectly. And when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, the brethren wrote, uh, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who, when he was come, helped them much which had believed through grace. Notice verse 28. For he mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly, showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. He used the Bible, he used the scriptures to defend what he taught, to convict people of, of their sins, convict them <clears throat> with the truth. Now, should we do the same thing? Should we do the same thing? Notice this. There's a... a Sign there in Eden, the Emmanuel Friends Church. <clears throat> Their sign says, defend the truth. Defend the truth with love. Now, friends, are you ready to defend the truth? If you really believe the truth, can you give a defense about what you believe? You know why we ask these preachers to come on and tell us what they believe, we want them to give a defense. If you know the preacher from the Emmanuel French Church, <clears throat> ask him if he'll come on and give a defense. Ask him if he'll come on and defend the truth that he preaches. Ask him if he'll come on and defend the truth in love. Now sometimes people say, by the way, people say, well, that means defend the truth and you're not very loving when you defend the truth. Well, Let's just see if that's really, you know, what that means. Is that, is that, really, uh, is that, is that really what, um, uh, is that talking about how you speak or is it speaking the truth out of love for the truth? So here, speaking the truth in love. Um, uh, verse 15. This is Ephesians. Ephesians 4.15. Speak the truth in love. How about speaking out of love for the truth? How about defend the truth with love for the truth? Some people don't love the truth any more than they, than they love an old stray dog. Or maybe they love the stray dog more than they love the truth. Because they'll take care of the stray dog. They'll feed him and nurture him, make sure he has everything he wants. But when it comes to truth, they don't care about it. They'll say anything, do anything, not even examine if it's, if it's really true or not. Do you really love the truth? Why don't you give a defense of it? Why don't you give a defense of the truth? See, I know your pastors won't do it. They let you call in and do it. Try to do it. They let you call in and they'll let you try to make a defense for why you believe what they believe, but they won't do it. You know why? Because they don't love the truth. They won't defend it. But the Bible, as a weapon, can be used in defense of the truth. It can defend itself, but it needs someone to do it. That's why we're not afraid to show, to stand up with the truth. Because we know the truth, the truth, if we handle it right, it'll never be hurt. It'll never be hurt. That's why we've had over 30 debates, over 30 debates, 
televised individuals, preachers, people from the pulpit, have come on to try to defend their doctrine. Baptist, Pentecostal, Islam, all, you name it. You know why? You know why they can't give a defense? Because they don't have the truth. They're not using the Bible as the weapon that it's designed to be used for. Now, is the Bible a weapon? Yes, it is. And that's why we're going to give a defense of it. That's why we're going to use it as a defensive weapon. That's why last week we talked about marriage. We're going to use the Bible to defend marriage. Now, there are some individuals that don't have that same desire. Now, I read you some of this last week. I read you some of this last week. about This is from the Presbyterian Church in their study and their examination of where they should be on the issues of marriage and divorce and same-sex marriage. And this is what they wrote. This is what they wrote. They said, some believe, see, some believe uh, some public rituals of blessing for the same-sex couples without a change of status as socially indeterminate. Others find it to be a helpful compromise. Some say, well, you say, some people say, no, you should, you should make a stand. Others say, well, no, it's a helpful compromise. Others believe that the blessing of same gender relationships may implicitly, if not explicitly, condone and or encourage the behaviors. So they're, they're kind of torn on it. This is what they say. Here are three other groups on the marriage issue, on same-sex marriage issue. Now, like I said, we went over this last week some. But notice what it says. The United Church of Christ who is in fellowship with the Presbyterian Church, says, we affirm that all humans are made in the image of likeness of God, including people of all sexual orientations. And God bestowed upon each one the gift of human sexuality. In other words, God made homosexuals homosexuals. Now, is that really true? Are we supposed to use the Bible as a, to defend that or to defend against it, to oppose it? Are we supposed to look at new biblical perspectives and say, well, the United Church of Christ may have it right. God made individuals a sexual being, therefore same-sex marriage is all right. Now, notice this. The United Church of Christ says we further recognize and affirm that as created in God's image and gifted by God with human sexuality, all people have the right to lead lives that express love, justice, mutuality, commitment, consent, and pleasure. So God made them, therefore, let them do it. Now watch this. The Reformed Church of America. Now this is really what I want to drive home. Look at this. The Reformed Church of, in America restricts marriage to the union of one man and one woman to the exclusion of all others. In 1996, the Reformed Church in America entered into dialogue with the United Church of Christ, the UCC. And here's what they said. Encouraging the UCC to move toward a more biblically faithful understanding of human sexuality and re repeal of all policies condoning homosexual behavior. Now, wait a minute. Is one of these groups wrong? Is the RCA, the Reformed Church in America, are they judging the United Church of Christ? Are they judging? Look at this. They said you need to move toward a more biblical, faithful understanding of human sexuality and repeal all your policies that condone homosexual behavior. Now, friends, you talk about us being mean. And you talk about us being judgmental. And you talk about us condemning all these other churches. But here is the Reformed Church in America that is doing the very same thing that we're trying to tell you in the Baptist, Methodist, Lutheran, Pentecostal, Presbyterian churches. You need to move toward a more biblically faithful understanding of the Bible. Period. Now, when we do that, you say we're judging. But the RCA 
is telling the UCC, you don't have a biblical, faithful understanding of what the Bible teaches. You need to change your policies. And that's what we've been saying. That's what we've been saying. Now, neither denomination changed its views. Better understanding resulted from the dialogue. In recent years, the RCA held three years of dialogue after which they affirmed their position on marriage. They stuck to their guns. Well, look. Are they using the Bible as a weapon to defend their position? Is the UCC defending the Bible, using the Bible to defend their position? See, friends, we can come to an understanding of what the Bible teaches. We can come to an understanding of what the Bible teaches. It's just a matter of whether we do it or not. Let's go ahead and put the phone numbers up, please. Now, let's look at another one. Here's the evangelical church. It affirms that marriage is a covenant between mutual promises, commitment, and hope authorized legally by the state and blessed by God. The historic Christian tradition of the Lutheran confessions have recognized marriage as a covenant between a man and a woman. All right? Now, here's my, here's my point again, friends. Are we using the Bible incorrectly? When we're saying one thing is wrong based upon the Bible, Look, the reason why you can say something is wrong from the Bible or something is right from the Bible is it doesn't contradict what the Bible said in any other places. It's just that simple. If, if what you teach contradicts what the Bible says in another place, then it's wrong. It's wrong. It's not true. Jesus said in John 10 and verse 33, The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. Jesus said, answered them, it is, not, is it not written in your law, I said, ye are gods? He quotes the Bible to them. And he says, If he called them gods unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken. You cannot, you cannot say that I am wrong if what I'm saying is consistent with what the Bible says. I can say you're wrong about homosexuality. If you say homosexuality is condoned or is okay by God because God wants people to love each other, uh -uh. That, that's not in the Bible. That doesn't, that doesn't fly with what God says somewhere else. Romans 1, God condemns homosexuality. 1 Corinthians 6, God condemns homosexuality. You're not going to turn around and tell me that God approves of homosexuality or that God made you as a homosexual. It's just not, you're just not going to believe it. You know why? Because the Scripture can't be broken. The scripture can't be broken. And that's why when we point out the teachings or the doctrines of, of various denominations, that's why, that's why we, we oppose the error because it's inconsistent. Now, if we're not supposed to use the Bible to justify a position, to justify a teaching that some people would say is a cultural position, what are you supposed to do with this right here? Look at this. What are we supposed to do with, with this situation? Here's old Charlie Sheen. He's been, he's been in the news. Everybody's talking about him. But here he is, and he's giving a report on his family. Now listen to what he says. These are my girlfriends. These are the women that I love that, um, that, have, that have completed the, uh, the three parts. Of now he's talking about his women, his goddesses. All right? former nanny and a porn star. You know, his girlfriends that he lives with. My heart. They were the women who were by his side throughout our interview. It's the Nat and the Rach. So that's your team It's not a circle, right it's a wedge. Boom. You form a wedge to uh, make room for the guy carrying the ball. 
<laughs> Natalie Kenley, a former nanny and model, and Rachel Oberlin, a porn star. Is this like a family for you? Absolutely. The two of you? Absolutely. Yeah, we all love and care about each other. So we all have our own connections with one another. Um, Natty and Charlie have their own special connection. I have my own connection with Charlie, and then Natty and I also have our own relationship. And it, it works well for us. I mean, it's, it's unconventional, and it seems crazy to everybody else, but for us, I mean, it works well. And we all love and respect each other and respect each other's boundaries. How did okay, it works. Yeah, that's a family. It works. Now, you know what? I seem to believe, I seem to remember that uh, there was a religious group <clears throat> that actually had to change its uh, teaching on marriage because uh, they said a man could have more than one wife. I can't remember what group they is. Uh, maybe the Mormons? Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? See, they, they gave up polygamy. But now, but now, and everybody, everybody talks bad about the Mormons. Treats them like a dog, you know. But then old Charlie Sheen comes along, and we can't be judgmental. We need to have new biblical perspectives because after all, you know, God doesn't frown upon people just because they can't reproduce. He wants them to be happy. So we're supposed to give Charlie Sheen a pass? And I heard Glenn Beck weighing in on Charlie Sheen. Now, I find it very interesting. The Mormon is condemning Charlie Sheen. <laughs> How ironic is that? You see what happens? When you get away from the biblical standard, then you have to give everything a pass. You want to work from the Lord? Hello? Yes. Hello? You're on the air. How does the situation with the Klan and Martins will fit you into this? Let's <clears throat> make this relative to the area. Okay. Instead of talking about California. Okay. The, the Klan, I say the Klan is just as bad as the Nation of Islam. They're both groups that say one color of skin is right. The Nation of Islam says black is right. The, Na the Ku Klux Klan says the white is right. And we're saying the gospel of Jesus Christ is the answer because it actually brings unity between individuals of all nationalities. It doesn't look on the outside of man. Now, and, 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 I, and the interesting thing is, they will both use, both of those groups will use the Bible in various ways to justify their position. And I'm saying, you know, they're using it as a weapon incorrectly because the Bible is not to be used to divide people. The Bible is a tool that actually brings people together. So, uh, yeah, I, and as a matter of fact, I think uh, uh, Johnny Robertson is supposed to be sitting down with some members, member or members of the the clan tomorrow. And I, he's going to tell them the same thing. You know, y'all, you're going about this all, all wrong. So uh, it fits in very well with what we're talking about. Just use the Bible for what it's designed to you be used for. Does that help you? Well, do you support the Klan's uh, uh, march and meeting for the second of... Uh, no. Oh. No, I don't. Why and would why I? Why is that? I'm sorry? Why do you not support it? Why would I support it? No, that's not the question. The question is, why do you not? I just why told you. Why do you support it? I just told you why I don't support it. Because the Bible says so. No, the Bible says, that's right, the Bible says that uh, G there's neither Jew nor Gentile, bond or free, male or female, all are one in Christ. The KKK says white is right, and everybody else is, is uh, inferior. Now, why would I support or be in agreement with them marching and promoting that ideology. 
Are you in support of it? Uh, no, I was just wondering if you were a true Christian that I thought that uh, surely you wouldn't be for that either. Well, I'm not. Oh, that's good. Yeah. And uh, I think uh, that that topic is certainly much more relevant to this area than talking about Charlie Sheen. Okay. Well, I'll tell you what, sir. You get your show, and you talk about what you think is relevant then. Oh, uh, no, no, no. Don't okay. get defensive. I'm not getting defensive. I'm just saying, sir. You, you are. You told you, me to get my you, show. Okay. Yes, okay. You well, you call in, you, sir. I open the phone line. The people to call in. Sir. Do you not want to call sir, in? Sir, do you not think that the situation that Charlie Sheen is promoting, everybody's focused on Charlie Sheen and his, and his so-called living arrangement, now, you don't think that's important? You don't think that's pertinent to this situation? Yeah, you don't but that's heard on every national network. Okay. It's heard so to probably, me, that, uh, that, 16 to, hours a day. Okay, so to me, that's what everybody's talking about, so why not bring it up? No, uh, no, you're not. No, you're talking about everybody in the country. Okay. I'm out locally. Okay. Well, sir, we're being watched all across the country. Well, you know, you should uh, you should encourage people to phone and get and give their opinion or ask you a okay. question if you don't want us okay. to. I I don't mind you giving your opinion, but when you say that I shouldn't be talking about Charlie Sheen, well, that's your opinion. And if you don't want to talk about Charlie uh, Sheen, you can get your show and you can talk about what you want to talk about. Let me uh, ask you a question. Go ahead. Do you honestly believe that the Mormons have given up polygamy? I think some of them have. Yeah, yeah some of them. What do you say, two in, out of a hundred? But, but here's, the, here's the thing, sir. What's the no. difference in the Mormons having two wives and somebody, some man out here having two or three girlfriends? What's the difference? I think there's a, I think there's a major difference. So you'd be okay with a man having several... Uh, uh, girlfriends living with the girlfriends? N not at all. But you the difference is that there's no. Uh, Charlie Sheen has not said that what he's doing has any kind of religious backing. It, it, this that, is totally. That's not he the takes point, though, sir. Responsibility for what sir. he's doing. But the point but is, he, but, he doesn't say. Sir, the Bible says sir, I can do okay. this. Sir, okay. So here's here's the thing, though. But if if Charlie Sheen, if what Charlie Sheen is doing is okay, then everything else has to be okay. Yeah, or if you say, or if you say, sir, now let me let me talk. Now let me talk. Let me talk. If you say, well, here is something that is okay, whatever it may be, homosexuality, or KKK, or whatever. If someone comes along and says, well, that's okay because the Bible says it. Well, you can't condemn Charlie Sheen whether he has any religious affiliations or not. Because we've already thrown the standard out the door. You see the problem? I see the problem in your reasoning, yes. You see the problem in my reasoning? Yes. So so what do we do about Charlie Sheen? Or someone so, like uh, him? Charlie Sheen needs some professional help. So, so and, what are we supposed to do about uh, that, though? Eventually he'll get it. So what are we supposed to get what? Is he doing something wrong? I didn't say that. I said, I, you asked me, did I agree with him? I said, no. But then what's, it, what's he doing wrong? Man. What's he doing wrong? Well, he's self-destructive and has hurt a lot of people. Okay. But let's get back again. Let's bring no. this home uh, instead of California. Okay. Uh, I'm bringing it home. Here, here's my point, though. You're saying Charlie Sheen's wrong, but you don't want me saying somebody else is wrong, apparently. No, you've already made your statements. I'm okay. just simply making my statement. Too. Okay. But here's but here's the thing. You said we shouldn't be discussing Charlie Sheen, but yet you just said he's self destructive, he's hurting a lot of people and he and he's wrong. Mm hmm So apparently you're in in form with Charlie Sheen. And I'm just saying the Bible is the standard that will help Charlie Sheen, the KKK, the Nation of Islam, and people like you and me. And what about the Mormons? What about the Mormons? The Bible will help them too. The Bible will help them? Yeah. Well, if they'd put down the Book of Mormon. 
You're a very naive man if you think that the Mormons do not still practice uh, polygamy. Now, sir, I, didn't, I, I just said, I said some of them probably still do. Well, but I'm saying the Mormons then, aren't they? The, the mainstream Mormons don't teach it or practice it. Do you, do you have a uh, thought? Can you tell me where I can find that statement? I'm saying, why don't you just you're, you're do some... You're telling me that they say that. Where, where is that? Where can I read that? Well, why don't you why don't do a little research and find the, uh, the, the change. Of the law. I think it was in the 70s. I'm not, I, I believe it's in the 70s when they changed their law. You believe it was in the 70s? Yeah, I think so. Why don't you, why don't you look it up ago, call back next week and, and tell us about it? You're quoting them now. But you can't tell me where it was. You just remember it from the 70s. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I see. So you know half the truth. Well, sir, do you do you know all the truth on that matter? No way. Do you know do you know do you know something about the Mormons that you can enlighten us on? Yes, I had a very good friend uh, who is a thirty-year-old Mormon, okay. and his father had was married had lived with his mother, and and still lives with two other women now. Okay. Okay. So, so when, when did they cha- and, and when did they change the law about uh, black people coming in? Sorry. When did they change their teaching on on the black people? Well, I, I don't know about that part. Oh, so you only know half the truth. I don't know whether that's true or not. But you only know half the truth on it. Sorry. I said you only know half the truth on that. Then. I, no. I, as a matter of fact, racially, I'm, I'm not. I have seen. Uh, uh, black people in the church. That's not. I'm not discussing the I, issue of race. I know, but I'm saying. I'm I know. I'm saying the in the Mormon church. Polygamy. I'm saying in the Mormon church, though. And, and that's another doc. That no, sir. That's another that doctrine. Sir, sir, sir. That's another doctrine that the Mormon church teaches. You chide me because I can't give you the exact date when they changed the law on on polygamy, but yet you but, can't give you. And you want to say that you're an authority on it, or more of an authority on it, but yet you can't give me something. So. I'm just saying, well, sir, wait, you wait, seem to be the kind of individual. You seem to be the kind of individual that just likes to find fault, but you, you won't look at yourself. If you go back and look at your statement, you said initially the Mormons changed their policy. Okay. And now you're saying their laws. Well, what, so sir, policy laws. Like? So you want to miss words? <laughs> they <laughs> once said they <laughs> once said polygamy was okay, and now they you say it's not words. okay. It's just a play on words. Oh, okay. So, poli- so if we look up the definition of policy and law, you don't think that they're they can be used uh, interchangeably? No, absolutely okay. not. Okay. So, so let's get this right. So, policy is not a law. If they change a policy, that's not a rule. That's not a law. A policy is something adopted by a particular group. A okay. law is something that's legislatively passed. And has the power of well, sir, enforcement behind sir, it. Sir, they adopt they adopt new laws and new policies all the time. I think you I think you need to go back and get a, a little bit more education. Well, sir, I think you do too. So okay, why don't then, you then why then don't you I'll study out the Mormons? Say one more thing, and I'll let you go. Oh, well, I'm out of time anyway, so I'm going to let you go to start with. I'm going to let you go because I'm out of time. I'm uh, it's ten o'clock right now. So, I would like to see one time. So, uh, sir, I, I'm, I'm going to have to go. Uh, you know, here's here's a guy that doesn't like to use the word. He he wants to mince words. You know, laws and policies, whatever. But my point is, is that uh, you have individuals that don't want to use the Bible as a as a weapon. They just want us to uh, forget everything that that God has for mankind morally, scripturally, and everything, and make their own rules. And you know, we just can't use that. We're going to use the Bible as God intended for us to use it. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to teach the truth, defend what needs to be defended, and preach what needs to be preached. And, uh, you know, we're going to be right with the Lord, whether man accepts it or not. Thanks for watching, friends. Remember to ask, what does the Bible say? And you always get a word from the Lord. We'll see you next week. Have a good night. For station WGSR 47.1 digital digital.
months. How many times have you asked yourself, have I taken my meds this morning? Dispil is an innovative and patented multi-dose packaging system that makes it easy to take your medication. Each blister pack contains 28 individual blisters, each of which contain a patient's medication for a specific intake time. Ask Keith or Kevin how Dispil unit dosing can meet your needs at Lane's Family Pharmacy, South Van Buren Road in Eaton, across from Moorhead Hospital.